Our text this afternoon comes to us from 1 Corinthians 10, the verses 14 through 22. Let's read that. (coughs) Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifice as participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice They offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So far God's word. Dear brothers and sisters, our passage this this afternoon calls us to examine ourselves as we consider the Lord's table. Celebrated the Lord's Supper a couple of weeks ago. And it calls us, in light of that, to flee from idolatry, as idolatry is incompatible with the table of the Lord. But is this text really relevant for us today? We do not live in a time of the Roman Empire where idol worship was a norm. And we are unlikely to be invited to have a meal in a local temple. At the same time, I'm sure we've all heard sermons about the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And we know that idolatry is still a temptation we face today. But is it something we need to strongly be on the guard for today? When we prepare to go to the Lord's table, is idolatry, fleeing from idolatry, something that needs to be foremost on our minds? Well, yes, it does. This afternoon we hear God's word as it comes to us through Paul's letter to the Corinthians with a theme. Participation in the table of the Lord is incompatible with participation in the table of demons. So flee idolatry. We'll have two points. The first the blessing of the participation in the table of the Lord, and secondly, the curse of participation in the table of demons. Participation in the table of the Lord is incompatible with participation in the table of demons, so flee idolatry. So first, the blessing of the participation of the table of the Lord. Now, Corinth was a Roman town, and as such, was full of idol worship. This meant that much food, especially meat, was offered to idols, including the meat sold in the marketplaces. At the same time, if you wanted to have a social gathering, to get together with family or friends or work colleagues, you would be unlikely to have enough space at home to meet together. So you'd have to look for another place. And a common practice was to have these gatherings at temples where there were lots of open places where groups could get together and have a celebration. A bit like we might have a big celebration in a restaurant if our homes aren't big enough. Of course, the food at the temples would be sacrificed to idols. But it wasn't like there were other options readily available. So that now that you're a Christian, what do you do? Could you eat food that had been sacrificed to idols And could you join a party or a get-together at one of the temples? There were Christians who said that you could. Their argument was that idols are not real and all food is to be eaten with thanks to God, to the Lord who made everything. And Paul says, you know what, you're right in some extent. To some extent you're right there. You have some good points. 
However, he continues to deal with the matter. From chapters 8 through 10, he continues to deal with the matter. And in chapter 10, he shows that idolatry was a serious problem and could not be taken lightly. The Israelites, after the exile, received so many spiritual blessings. Paul compares them to the blessings the church receives in the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper. However, because of their idolatry, God was angry with Israel and overthrew many of them in the desert. Think about it. These were the very people he had rescued from Egypt. Paul warns the Corinthians that these things were recorded as an example to us, to us who were in the last times. Because idolatry is such a danger, Paul urges the Corinthians to flee from idolatry. And this is where our text starts. Now, instead of just telling them what to do or not to do in response to their debate, he reasons with them. He acknowledges that they are sensible people. They are the church of God, equipped by the Holy Spirit, so they have all they need to make a good decision, a wise decision for themselves. And just like he started the example of the Israelites in the wilderness by pointing to their blessings, he starts addressing the Corinthians by pointing to the spiritual blessings that they and us have in the Lord's table. When we partake of the cup of blessings and break the bread, is it not a participation in the body and blood of Christ? It's clear that Paul expects the Corinthians to quickly answer, yes, of course. But what does it mean to participate in Christ's body and blood? What does it mean for us to sit at the table and eat and drink the bread and the wine? It means that when we eat the bread and drink the wine, it is more than just a symbolic action. It is more than just a remembrance of what Jesus has done. When we partake of the bread and the wine, we participate in the body and blood of of Christ, we have communion with him. We are united to him. That's what Jesus taught when he said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Us abiding or living in Christ, Christ abiding or living in us, that's how close a connection we have with our Lord Jesus. When we eat, the bread and drink from the cup, we are united to Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that at other times we are not united to Christ or that we become united to Christ because of the Lord's Supper. Our unity with Christ is already shown to us in our baptism. We are constantly united to Christ by the Holy Spirit who lives both in us and in Him. It is through the Holy Spirit that we are in Jesus and that Jesus is in us. At the same time, the unity is strengthened by participation in the Lord's Supper. By it, we are spiritually nourished, strengthened, and comforted. We are spiritually refreshed and renewed. Participating in the Lord's Supper does the same for our souls as food and drink do for our bodies. Although we do not understand how exactly the Holy Spirit strengthens our unity with Christ, Scripture is clear that he does. And that unity or participation in the body and blood of Christ is a great blessing. We love Jesus. And there is nothing more precious to us than to be so closely connected to him. It is a great privilege for us, his creation, to have such a close relationship with him. And this is even before we consider our sinfulness. We have a marvelous God who wants to have a very close relationship with us, his creation. Sin, of course, broke that relationship. However, when we are united with Christ, that relationship is healed. The body of Jesus was broken and the blood of Jesus was poured out for our sin. Our sins have been paid for. And because of our unity with Christ, 
it is as if we ourselves had paid for those sins. Have a, have a chance afterwards. Have a look at question and answer 60 of the Heidelberg Catechism, the beautiful language, as if we ourselves. That's how real this is, how good that unity with Christ is. With our unity in Christ, we participate in his sacrifice on the cross. And sin does not only include the evil things, the bad things that we've done. It also includes all the good that we should have done, but did not do. The time when we should have helped someone, a brother, a sister, our our parents, our neighbor, but we didn't. The times when we should have comforted or encouraged someone in need, but we couldn't be bothered or we were too afraid to. All these good things that we should have done, Christ has done in our place. And because we are united with him, these things are credited to us as if we ourselves had done them. With our unity in Christ, we participate in the blessing of the cross. The participation in Christ's sacrifice that we have in the Lord's Supper is a great blessing to us. Through this participation, we become innocent in God's eyes and can look forward to an eternal life and a new creation in his presence. At the same time, this unity with Christ also means that we are united to one another. As Paul puts it, because there is one bread, and that bread referring to Christ, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one bread bread. There is unity in the body of Christ that exists because of our relationship with Christ. We belong together. Each one of us is a valuable member of Christ's body. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, we also are reminded of that. We are the communion of the saints brought together and held together by our Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship we have is a special one. There's much more that can be said to that, but we'll leave it for now. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, remember and consider the blessings we receive at the table of the Lord. Remember that through our participation in the body and blood of Jesus, we are again right with God and can look forward to a life everlasting in the presence of God and of each other. That brings us to our second point, the curse of participation in the table of demons. Having pointed to the blessings that the Corinthians and we have in the Lord's Supper, Paul now goes on to show how dangerous it is to participate in the table of demons. It brings us under the curse. Though the Corinthians are in a post-sacrificial era of the church, they need to remember that participating in a sacrificial meal means something. It meant something for Israel to take part in the sacrifice of the temple. Most of those sacrifices were not completely burned up. For most of them, a portion was taken off and the people ate it. The people who brought the sacrifice also ate from the sacrifice. When they ate from the sacrifice, they were participants in the altar. There was a connection with the animal being sacrificed on their behalf. Now, Paul is not arguing that foods offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. Idols are not real gods, and so the food sacrificed to them is not really a true sacrifice. However, he is implying that there is a spiritual reality behind these sacrifices. Just like the sacrifices in the temple were offered to God, the sacrifices offered to idols are offered to demons. And demons are real. And the Corinthians cannot deny their existence. Paul does not want the Corinthian Christians to be participants with demons. They are participants in Christ and in his crucifixion. The sacrifice that frees us from the power of Satan and his kingdom. 
Christians have nothing to do with that kingdom. The two are incompatible. And that's why Paul tells the Corinthian church, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. If you join in or partake in the parties of idol worshipers, you are uniting yourself to the worship of demons. As Christians, we are participants of Christ. We share in His blood, and therefore we cannot participate with demons. We cannot be united with them. We partake of the table of the Lord, and we as the body of Christ share in the Lord. Therefore, we cannot partake in the table of demons. We cannot join ourselves to the demons and those who sacrifice to them. In the Corinthian context, this meant not going to the temple to have a party or a social gathering. It was something that would have cost them socially. It would mean saying no to invites by unbelieving family, friends, co-workers. It meant they were most likely going to be socially ostracized, social outcasts. But then going back to the question that we asked at the start of the sermon, what about us today? Do we really need to be careful to make sure that we are fleeing from idolatry? Is this really an issue today? Well, yes, it is. There's two reasons. First, as the Western world abandons the worship of God, the worship of idols or false gods is becoming ever more common around us. And secondly, as Calvin so aptly put it, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Now, we do not have to look too hard to see idol worship increasing in our Canadian context. The indigenous people are encouraged to revive and practice their traditional spirituality. The god of sexual sin is heavily promoted both by both government and businesses. We only need to look at the promotions around Pride Month and Pride Parades. People from many different countries, many different religions are moving to Canada and taking their idolatry with them. And they are often very sincere in their idolatry. At the same time, lately there seems to be a trend for politicians, even Christian ones, and government organizations to congratulate every different religion on their religious feast days and to even get involved in their celebrations. They do this to win the group's favor, to get in their good books. If you want to be favored by today's society, promote any or all of these false religions, these idolatries. But if you condemn these idolatries, be prepared to be scorned or even punished. So how do we flee idolatry today? By not attending their celebrations. Just like the thought of going to a pride parade should be revolting to us, so should the thought of going to a Hindu or a Sikh celebration. Both are celebrations of a false god. Both are idolatry. We should not even congratulate someone on a Ramadan or any other feast that does not acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not approve of the worship of demons, and we do not want to be associated with it by approving of it. Don't think that these sort of gestures are, are empty gestures that aren't a great insult to our God. There's only one true God. Paul has spoken about the Israelite, Israel committing this type of idolatry when he said in verses 7 to 8, Do not be idolaters as some of them, as it is written, that people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Paul is here referring to Israel's idolatry with a golden calf and by joining in with the Moabite sacrifices to their gods. However, Paul continues, verse 9, we must not put Christ 
to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the stro- destroyer. This is a different type of idolatry. Here, Paul refers to Israel complaining about God, bringing them out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. Paul also refers to Israel's refusal to enter and conquer the promised land before fear that they would be killed by the Canaanites and that their women and children would be their prey. These were occasions when Israel was concerned over their own comfort and well-being and so rebelled against God instead of faithfully trusting and obeying him. This was an idolatry of the self. They were their own idol. When Saul did not wipe out the Amalekites as commanded, God sent Samuel to tell to him to tell him that rebellion is as a sin of divination. And presumption, that's outright rebellion, is an, as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion against God, choosing to do your own will rather than God's will, is idolatry. It is idolatry of the self. Sin or rebelling against God is making ourselves our own God rather than submitting to the one true God. That's why God commands us, put to death, therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Here's where the command to flee idolatry hits to the core of the heart. Where do our priorities lie? Where are our loyalties? To our own comfort? Our own well-being? Our own desires? That was where Satan, the prince of demons, wants our priorities to be. That is where he focused the hearts of Adam and Eve in the garden. The fruit of the tree will make you like God. Isn't that a good thing? Think about what it will do to you. You will receive such a benefit. And Adam and Eve, looking to benefit themselves, ate from the fruit and became slaves of the devil. Mercifully, God also saved them from this. But when they rejected God as Lord, they became united to Satan. But what about us? Brothers and sisters, we must honestly examine ourselves. And we're called to do that every time we come to the Lord's table honestly and carefully examine ourselves. Are we focused on our own desires? Or are we focused on the Lord's desires? And do not brush aside self-examination by looking at the faults of others. We are called to examine ourselves, look at our own hearts. Paul told the Corinthians, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. We are tempted to serve idols, just like Adam and Eve, just like Israel in the desert, just like the Corinthian church. Paul also said, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed, lest he fall. If we think that we are spiritually strong, watch out. Pride comes before the fall. We are called careful self-examination. The stakes are high. Paul concludes our text by saying, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Are we willing to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Our Lord is a jealous God, and he will not allow us to worship any other God, either beside him or instead of him. He will not accept that. Our loyalties cannot be divided. If they are, we fall under his wrath. Do we think 
that we can stand under his wrath? That we are stronger than the Lord? His wrath is his covenant curse. And do we think that we can treat the covenant curse lightly as if we can bear up under it? Paul doesn't give an answer in our text. The answer is obvious. No. Brothers and sisters, while the warning is unpleasant to hear, this warning is needed because of our natural weakness, our natural inclination to sin and to ignore and excuse sin in our lives. Please don't brush it off. At the same time, this warning is given in the context of hope. Paul also reminded the Corinthians and us that our faithful God will not let us be tempted beyond our ability, but will instead provide a way of escape. So brothers and sisters, don't be afraid to see the sin in your own lives for fear of the battle that you know must follow afterwards. Don't be afraid to see the sin in your own lives because you're afraid to fight it. Examine yourself knowing that with the Holy Spirit, with the power of God himself, you can overcome the sin that you find. And as further encouragement, consider who Paul is writing to. The church in Corinth was plagued by sin. This entire letter is Paul dealing with sin after sin in the church. However, they were still the church of Christ. Paul was not saying, stop celebrating the Lord's Supper because you are sinful. No. Instead, he is saying, examine yourself so that you can celebrate the Lord's Supper. He wanted them to celebrate the Lord's Supper. However, he did not want them to do so as idolaters, thinking that they were coming to the table of the Lord to receive the blessing, while in fact, they were under the curse. God, through Paul, was calling the Corinthian church to honest self-examination. And he's also calling us to honest self-examination. Not so that we can avoid the table of the Lord, but so that if we are being idolatrous, we will see it, flee from it, and join the table of the Lord with all its blessings. God wanted the Corinthians to receive the blessings of the Lord's tables. That's why he saw, sent Paul to, to, to call them to repentance instead of leaving them to wallow in their own sin. God wants us to receive the blessings of the Lord's table. And that's why he also calls us to examine ourselves. So what do you do if you're sitting here and you've realized, you know what, I'm living in idolatry. I'm living for myself rather than for God. Realize, you know what? I'm in the danger of, of God's curse. What do you do? Then repent. Pray to God, even as you sit here today. Ask God to forgive your sins, confess your sins to Him. He has promised that he will forgive you. Ask God for the strength to fight against your sins. He has given us the Holy Spirit so we can do it. He'll answer that prayer. And then know that you, a broken-hearted sinner, are welcome to the table of the Lord. In fact, you must come. The, table, the Lord commands you to come to partake of his body and blood, to be united with him, so that, and so receive full forgiveness of all your sins and his righteousness. Amen.